Okay. Um, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk and please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Uh, second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, therefore no classified discussion is allowed. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Um, uh, let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Dr. Uh, colleague Jawed, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering of the University of California, Los Angeles and the principal investigator of the Structure Computer uh, Interaction Laboratory. He received his PhD and master's degree in mechanical engineer engineering from um, MIT in 2016 and 2014. Uh, he holds dual bachelor's degree in aerospace uh, engineering and engineer, um, engineering uh, physics from the University of Michigan. Ann Arbor. Uh, he also served as a postdoctoral researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. He received NSF Career Award in 2021, the Outstanding Teaching Award from UCLA in 2019, the Outstanding Teaching Assistant Award from MIT in 2015, and, the, and then uh, the GSNP Best Speaker Award at the American Physics Society March meeting in 2014. Today, Khalid will present an exciting topic, which is reduced order modeling and inverse design of Flexible Structures by Machine Learning. Please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Khalid uh, by asking one random question as usual. Uh, it's it's easy question. Uh, what is your favorite movie, Khalid? I think my favorite movie is uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, it's a Western movie by Clint Eastwood. Uh, and I usually like most of Clint Eastwood movies. Oh, I see. Okay, well, stage is yours. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Chai, for introducing me. Uh, my name is Khalid Jawed. I'm an associate professor at UCLA. Uh, today, I'll be talking about reduced order modeling and inverse design. So I'll be talking about forward simulations and backward design. And we'll be using a combination of physics, of course, and machine learning. <clears throat> and uh, the content of my talk is based on work done by my students and postdocs. They're Dezong Tong, Andrew Chai, uh, Lei Xin Ma, who is now an assistant professor at Arizona State, Chaofeng Li, who is now a postdoc at MIT, uh, Tiani Wang, um, who joined the industry last year, and Murunmai Mungekar and Shivam Panda. Both of them are PhD students in my lab. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with Professor Jung Sok Ju and Bhani Rai Choudhury of UCLA, as well as Professor Miha Brohan of the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, broadly speaking, the work in my lab is in the intersection of mechanics, which is uh, my PhD field. Our primary focus uh, application area is robotics. So we use mechan mechanics-based tools and simulations in robotics as well as we also use machine learning and computer graphics. These are some of the main tools in our toolbox. So uh, let me give you a brief outline of my talk today. Uh, first, I will be talking about physics-based simulations of, of, uh, of rods, right? So ropes and tying knots in ropes. I won't talk about machine learning in the first part, then, I will talk about using machine learning for model reduction, right? So how can I speed up these physics-based simulations? For example, how can I uh, reduce a complicated rod model into a simplified beam model? And then I will talk about how I can reduce a plate model to a simpler rod model. In the last part of my talk, I will talk about inverse design. So given a target shape, how can I go about achieving that shape? So, before we go, go into, the, into the crux of my talk, let's go over some definitions. Okay, I, I, my understanding is uh, not all of you are familiar with mechanics. So there are various terms like beams, rods, ribbons, plates, and shells. Like what are those? So a beam is a structure whose length is much, much larger than the height and the width. And a beam can only bend, so it will undergo two-dimensional deformation. A rod 
is geometrically similar to a beam. It has its length is much, much larger than the uh, width and the height. For example, a 10 plant tendril, it can bend, but also it can twist. And depending on some rod model, it can stretch as well. So the deformation can happen in 3D, for example, in this plant tendril. A ribbon is close to a rod, but its length is much, much larger than the width, and its width is much, much larger than the height. So this is an example of a ribbon. Um, plates and shells. Uh, so plate, its length and width are of the similar order of magnitude, but both of these two dimensions are much, much larger than the height. The natural con configuration of a plate is two-dimensional. So initially it is two-dimensional, but then under deformation it can take three-dimensional shape. A shell is a superset of plates. So a, the natural configuration of a, of a shell can be three-dimensional, for example, this hat here. So the in first part of my talk, I will talk about simulation of rods. And uh, especially when it comes to things like contact and friction, for example, when you're tying your shoelace or tying some simple knot, uh, contact and friction can be important. And how can we, purely using physics, how can we go about developing fast simulation of such uh, such structures. Uh, si similar simulation method can be used for cables and ropes and and surgery uh, and and so on. So before we go into discrete elastic rods algorithm, let's think of a simple mass spring system. Okay, it has two degrees of freedom, x1 and x2. I can write down. Just using Newton's second law, I can write down equations of motion, which is mass times acceleration is equal to the sum of elastic or internal and external force. The elastic force, that is just Hooke's law tells me is just k times negative k times x, right? I can write it like this. The elastic force is the negative gradient of the elastic energy, and the elastic energy of a spring is one half k x squared, right? Nothing too interesting about this. We will be using a similar method to, to simulate uh, rods as well as not tied in, rod, tied in rods. So the, the model behind the rod simulation that goes back to Kirchhoff and we'll be using some variation of uh, Kirchhoff's rod model. The elastic energy for a spring it is one half kx squared. For a rod, it is the sum of three types of energies, elastic bending, elastic twisting, and elastic stretching, right? So bending means you, of course, you know what is bending. Twisting means you hold a rod and then you, you rotate one end with respect to the other. And stretching means you just try to elongate the rod or you try to compress the rod. <clears throat> now we'll be using a simulation tool. We'll be, we'll be adopting a simulation tool called the discrete elastic rods. So it, this simulation tool will develop, was developed by the computer graphics community, uh, and it has been used in movies like The Lord of the Rings and Planet of the Apes and The Hobbit for simulation of, of hair and far and other rod-like structures. And uh, we imported this simulation tool to mechanical engineering. This was done during a PhD, and we studied things like uh, coiling of rods, bacterial locomotion, carbon nanotubes, and so on using a similar simulation tool. Now in DER or discrete elastic rods, the continuous rod is represented by the center line gamma as well as the twist angle theta. So when I want to fully describe a rod, I don't need, I, I, in addition to the center line, I also need the rotation or the material frame of the rod along the center line, right? That is why in addition to the center line gamma, I need this, rotation information or twist information theta. So before we implement this in our numerical algorithm, we divide the rod into a bunch of nodes and my degrees of freedoms are the nodal coordinates xi as well as the rotation angle or twist angle theta i, right? Then my total elastic force of this rod is the sum of stretching, bending and twisting energies across all the nodes, okay? Then what I will be doing is I can simply use this type of equation to solve 
for the configuration of the rod, right? So then I can I can you know, simulate, I can move forward in, in time. Now, I would like to point out that this is different than let's say finite element method. The reason is I am building up the energy in the discrete setting. And then, so I have the energy formulation in discrete setting, and then I will be using uh, Newton's second law at every degree of freedom to simulate the new, uh, to simulate this uh, the structural system, right? This is different than finite element because in a finite element you have um, you're solving the smooth equations assuming some discretization. So now let's write down our equa uh, equations of motion for discrete elastic rods. So this is a system of equations. So if I have n nodes, I will have three n degrees of freedom for the nodal coordinates and n minus one degrees of freedom for this theta angle. So in total, I have four n minus one equations of motion. Right? <clears throat> I will be writing down the elastic energies. So the bending energy is related to the change in angle between two subsequent edges, right? An edge is the cylinder connecting two nodes, right? So this, like this angle is kind of the turning angle and I can formulate by bend, my bending energy from this turning angle. Then twisting energy, again, I'm not going into the details of the uh, mathematics here um, because this was done like in 2010. So I just want to kind of uh, glance over it. Twisting energy is related to the change in the theta angle. Stretch, stretching energy is related to how much I'm pulling, what is the elongation in the in each cylinder in between two nodes. So then I can write down elastic energy like this, right? So my elastic energy is a sum of these small packets of energies at every node. These small packets of discrete energies at every node that depend on the two curvatures, they're coming from bending, the twist that is coming from twisting, the axial stretch, which is coming from stretching, and a set of parameters that I call theta, all right? I can take the gradient of the elastic energies like this and get my expression for the elastic force, right? So this is where I will be plugging in this expression. This theta parameter, the reason I'm using this is to draw some parallel between neural networks. This theta parameter is essentially the constitutive law, right? So for a rod, if I'm using a purely physics-based model, they will be related to terms like bending stiffness EI, twisting stiffness GJ, uh, stretching stiffness EA, where E is the, is the Young's modulus. Anyway, so I can divide my second order differential uh, equation that, represent, that represents the, equa the equations of motion. I can divide it into two first order uh, differential equation, and then I can, I can solve it, right? Um, I forgot to mention that the external energy that is problem specific, right? Sometimes I will have friction, sometimes I will have gravity, sometimes I will have a combination of the of the of the of a few external energies. So we have used this method and implemented uh, contact and friction to simulate, let's say, things like a soft robot. So I have experiments on top and simulations at the bottom. The experiments were done at Carnegie Mellon with Carmel Majidi's group, and the simulations were done at UCLA. Uh, this robot is a shape memory polymer, sorry, shape memory alloy based robot. So there are shape memory alloys embedded inside these soft composites. And by actuating, that is applying current to the shape memory alloy, I can selectively actuate one or more limbs. So now this is an example where I have inclined the plane by three degrees. So instead of perpendicular to gravity, the plane is three degrees with, uh, the normal to the plane is uh, makes an angle of three degrees with gravity. But then if I make it six degrees, uh, in both experiments and simulations, the robot cannot move forward. So this is important because now I can see that my simulation is fast, but also it can actually uh, has predictive ability. Right? <clears throat> This is an example on a sine on a sinusoidal surface, and then if I start the robot from the top of the sine uh, sine curve, you'll see that the both of them will roll. Um, 
And of course, there's there some differences between experiments and simulations um, that has to do with the number of fitting parameters and, and, and so on, but still they're qualitative lag periods. So now if I plot the computational time divided by wall clock time as a function of the time step size of the simulations for a few cases, uh, if I take a, like a time step size below 10 to the minus three second, my simulation will still above 10 to the power minus three seconds. So if I take like a large enough time step, my simulation still converges, but I can actually run this thing faster than, than real time using our preliminary implementation. However, in the future, we can we can think that you know, like we can speed up, we can further speed up the computation and use it for, uh, for real time control. So this is, um, th this robot that I showed that is still, um, you know, like is a, everything was happening in 2D, right? So what I want to do now is I want to show that we can actually run simulations with a bit more complicated three-dimensional topology. And this work was done uh, at UCLA with Andrew Choi and Zong Tong. Both of them are my PhD students. A really critical part of external force is, uh, is the forces that will come from friction and contact. Now, the main contribution of this work was to augment DER to properly account things like friction and contact. And the way we do it is we treat the contact almost like an internal or elastic energy. Okay. So let's say I'm zooming in into, I'm zooming into a so-called contact pair. So I have a rod, some, and the rod is composed of a number of cylinders. There are pairs of cylinders that will contact each other. Okay. So let's say this is one cylinder and this is another cylinder. The minimum distance between them is delta. Okay. Now for simplicity, let's take a two-dimensional view. <laughs> if they contact each other and if there's relative motion between the two, which is VREL, right, I will have a frictional force and a contact force. Contact force will try to prevent contact and frictional force will try to prevent the relative motion. Now, theoretically, if I want to come up with a term like contact energy as a function of the H to S distance delta, right, which is the minimum distance between two cylinders, then theoretically it is a heavy side step function right, that if the minimum distance between two cylinders, if that is larger than the diameter of the rod, then there is no contact energy. If it is below that, then the contact energy is infinity uh, because you know, a contact is 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 not possible at least theoretically. However, what we do is if I smoothen this energy so that I can take derivatives of it, we do see a lot of without any without much sacrifice in physical accuracy, we will see computational speed up because now instead of dealing with constraints i can take the gradient and hessian of this contact energy and implement that in my dr simulation okay. so i'm not going over the details of all the implementation but let's do a test with these are simulation let's do a test with simple overhand knot depending on the number of turns in the knot which i call unknotting number n Let's say I tie a number, one, two, three, or four turns in my overhand knot, and I, I keep pulling on it, you will see that there will be a buckling, which is called snap buckling. And this, the onset of buckling will depend on the unknotting number. So when n equals to four, the buckling happened the, the soonest, then buckling happened here, when n equals to three. Eventually buckling will happen at n equals to two, and n equals to one, it will never undergo buckling. So we have done qualitative as well as, have, as some quantitative studies to show that our method actually works. However, uh, I'm kind of skipping um, those validations, but at least we can actually uh, run these examples. Here's another example, which has a bit more of a practical significance. Uh, and this has to do with simulation of bacteria. Okay? What happens in bacteria is 
there will be oftentimes there will be two or more so called flagella or helical structures they will be rotating next to one another and because of hydrodynamic attraction between multiple flagella they'll come close and form a bundle and this mechanism is used by various common bacteria like salmonella and e coli and so on this is a model experiment from 2003 uh, by Tom Powers at Brown University and his collaborators. What we have done here is we have incorporated our contact model with hydrodynamics. I didn't go over the details of hydrodynamic implementation, but I'm just showing you that it is possible. And then depending on how many filaments I have, of course, the shape and the bundling behavior and all of that, that will be very different. So here, I assume that the friction is zero just purely because of hydrodynamic attraction. So multiple parts of the filament are generating flows. Those flows are interacting with one another, and that is causing the filaments to actually come together and form a bundle, which is something that is known to happen in, in uh, bacteria. Now, in the later part of the video, uh, here, what you see is I'm changing the friction coefficient uh, just to show that if I increase the friction coefficient, the bundling behavior will be slightly different and we can qualitatively capture uh, this behavior. So when friction coefficient is zero, there is contact uh, and initially all of them kind of look similar, but as time goes on, you will see that there is more contact here and less contact here. So this can give us some insight about, you know, about the surface property or this of bacterial flagella, or this can at least help us design bacteria-inspired robots. That is something that we are doing in our lab as well. Okay, and then we, of course, we we have to do comparison with the state of the art. Uh, so there is another method called uh, implicit incremental potential contact uh, that also came out recently in 2020 and we do some comparison. This, I would say, is kind of the uh, column to look at. Uh, our runtime is from some simple, from preliminary studies, it looks like, looks like that our runtime is better than um, the, the method from uh, 2020. All right, so this far I didn't use any machine learning, but what I showed, what I showed is that we have some physics-based numerical methods that are pretty fast can simulate contact friction, and we have shown that we can apply them to study robots and uh, bacterial flagella and so on, right? So now um, I want to take, I want to keep the crux of this physics-based algorithm, but I want to augment it using, using machine learning. And what I want to show is that we can use machine learning to reduce a three-dimensional rod model into a simplified beam model. So I want to cut down the degrees of freedom so that the computation is faster. And I want to you kind of learn from experimental and or fine-grained simulation data the constitutive behavior of this system. Right? I'm taking Slinky as an example. Uh, it's just as a test case. So Slinky is pretty cool because you know, like people, kids use it. It can walk down the stairs like in this video. And uh, other researchers have tried to develop uh, reduced models for Slinky. So for example, in this study, uh, the Slinky was represented as its center line, right? Now, most of the time the simulation, the, the deformation of a Slinky is restricted to 2D. So I can actually just use two dimensional beam model in theory, I should, in principle, I should be able to use some variation of two-dimensional beam model to simulate Slinky. However, the elastic bending energy, right? That is no longer uh, bending stiffness times curvature squared or anything, right? It is gonna be a lot more complicated. So for example, in this study, they tried to come up with a elastic energy model like this. Uh, and there's some similar applications. Uh, for example, a soft robot can be simulated as its spine using its spine based model and a new net actuator i can also try to simulate that using its beam based center line right now before i go into 
now I will show how we can use machine learning to, to uh, reduce the model from a three dimensional rod to a 2D beam. But before that, I just want to kind of uh, qualitatively explain what will be, what is it that will really be going on? When we, when you know, you're developing an end to end machine learning model of a time varying system, oftentimes we model both the underlying governing equations as well as the constitutive behavior. Right? However, we know that the underlying governing equations that are sometimes well known, that is just oftentimes just F equals to MA like equation. What we should focus on is enforce the governing equations, but try to learn the constitutive law. For training a framework like this, we can either use experiments or we can use like a purely physics based but fine grained computational expensive simulation, right? Right now we are focusing more on using existing purely physics based simulations that are very time consuming. However, in the future we can envision that experimental data can be used to train these models, which will be pretty cool because then we can imagine that you know, a robot will learn from its behavior and then uh, come up with reduced models that can run real fast in its brain, in its, uh, in, in, in its CPU and uh, adapt its, its locomotion. So I can use, now in my case, I can use a three-dimensional DER to, mod, to model something like this, or I can use just the, this red center line to simulate the same thing. And how to learn the constitutive law of this red center line so that I can simulate it faster is the goal. This is where we'll be using a method from 2018 called, the, called Neural Ordinary Differential Equations. So, you know, a ResNet is a, you know, a series of layers like this. So XT plus one is XT plus some, you know, some combination of parameters. Neural ODE is a framework to learn a system in the continuous, in its continuous limits. So I can learn a system like, I, I can learn theta but theta is my constitutive parameters, if you recall from my from the first part of my talk, right? Now, in our work, we cast our system like this. So again, if you recall from, you know, from the first part of my talk that I said that I can divide my second order uh, differential equation into two first order equations. And what I have to learn now is I have to learn what are these theta parameters. For a three-dimensional DER, the, the theta parameters are related to bending stiffness, twisting stiffness, and stretching stiffness, and so on. But now I am representing a three-dimensional slinky using a beam, right? Now the theta parameters or the constitutive parameters for that beam is not known. Right? That is something that we have to learn. So let's go over the method to do that, okay? So I, I decompose a slinky into uh, nc minus two, two for the two n terminals, right? So nc minus two triplets. So I take three three rings, right? And decompose my slink into that. Now at every ring, right, I have three nodes and a and, and this alpha parameter, which is the angle that the mid node will make with the gravity. Now I'll be using a relative coordinate system so that my results don't depend on um, on my choice of the coordinate frame. So I can use zeta one, zeta two, zeta three, and zeta for these four parameters too, as my uh, degrees of freedom, okay? And then of course, if I know these parameters, I can back calculate uh, the nodal, nodal coordinates as well as this alpha angle. I'll be using my same equations of motion, right? So mass times acceleration is equal to the elastic force plus, my external force now is some damping plus gravity, and the elastic force is just the negative gradient of the elastic energy. Okay? And the elastic energy is the sum of all the elastic energies, and each elastic energy is located at the triplet. The one thing to keep in mind is, and this is something really critical, and one of the contributions of our work is that, okay, uh, 
I need to account for not just translational and rotational symmetry. I also need to make sure that reflection along X, Y are compound reflections, so reflection along both X and Y, they don't affect my formulation, right? My translation and rotation, that is taken care of because I'm using relative coordinate system to make sure that reflection, reflections don't matter. What I do is I feed my result, sorry, I feed my degrees of freedom parameter, which is data parameters, and a copy of it through X reflection, a copy of it through Y reflection, and a copy of it through compound reflection, feed it through the neural network and add all of them up. And then of course I can divide it by four if I, if I want to, so that I guarantee that my energy doesn't depend on reflection. And of course it doesn't depend on translation and rotation. And this is the neural network architecture that was used. And I'm going to be using again this uh, equations of motion. And I have a formulation now for my uh, elastic energy and my elastic force. And I train these theta parameters, which is my constitutive law or represents my constitutive law using full three dimensional discrete elastic rods framework. Right. And um, now I have trained my elastic energy, and then I will be I'm, I, uh, I'll be using a uh, I'll be using a flowchart like this, like a method like this. So I won't go over again. I don't want to go over the details of this. I just want to very briefly kind of explain what is going on. So I divide a slink into a bunch of triplets. I feed the each triplet through my neural network. Then I get the elastic energy. I know how to calculate my gravity and my damping parameters. I add all of them up and say that is equal to mass times acceleration. And then I solve my, uh, my equations of motion, right? So I have my experiments, my DR simulation and my reduced order machine learning instance simulation. Uh, and you know, of course they seem to agree with each other. Now, if I do my uh, comparison with times, uh, like competition time comparison, in this case, uh, DR is, or like ML assisted simulation is about uh, 50 times, 50 to 60 times uh, faster than, than full order DR simulation, right? So just to show that the, poten the potential that, um, you know, we can, we already have a fast simulation tool that, can, that has been used in movies and so on, but depending on the setup, we can even speed up this, uh, these simulations and then use them for things like control and optimization and so on, right? So this is my, um, in, in this video, like, we are first using some data to train. So we are training and then we're extrapolating uh, a long time. But now I think the better, so the better part of this algorithm is that I can change the size of the slinky and I don't have to use any more retraining. But I, and I, my DR experiments and neural network, they kind of all seem to agree. I can even change the boundary condition and I have experiments DR and neural network. So of course now the neural network based simulation that kind of starts to deviate a little bit, but that has to do with, with uh, training accuracy. If I half my density, even then it can work. If I have my elasticity, then the bounciness will be even more. So uh, then my DR and neural network both, uh, based simulation, both of them seem to agree. Um, then we should of course compare with some I would, I would call them brute force methods. So like, you know, you can use a convolutional neural network to essentially map, right, one, one triplet to the next triplet. And we are using the same neural network for ESNN, which is our proposed method and a convolutional neural network. Actually, we're not using the same neural network. This is using a CNN. Um, but anyways, using, uh, if, Pure CNN is used, then uh, it starts to deviate after some time. So we train it on here, but then it don't generalize to, to changes in boundary condition. I can directly, I can use, uh, I can directly compare that with uh, force-based method. So I, I map my coordinates to forces. Now here, I use the same neural, like a similar neural network architecture, not the same, but the architecture remains the same. So the number of layers and nodes, they remain the same. And again, it fails after some time. I can also use purely energy-based methods. So I'm just, you know, like I'm just mapping one coordinate to the the system of coordinates to energy, uh, and it still doesn't work very well. Um, one of the reasons is that um, that when you 
trained neural network, right, there will always be some error. And when you want to use that neural network in a in a in a method like Newton's method, uh, you will need a gradient and the Hessian. So those little errors in a neural network, you take the gradient of it and Hessian of it that seem to blow up. Now, another question is, you know, can physicists sometimes use these methods, right? Uh, for example, can we get physical insight from my from my neural from the trained neural network? So I'm plotting the energy from the trained neural network as a function of this. I would call it the bending angle. Right? I'm plotting the energy as a function of this bend angle at different values of of length, or rather the distance between triplets. Imagine that if you elongate a triplet, it gets stiffer, so it is more difficult to bend. If you elongate a slinky, it gets more difficult to bend. So this is what we what we see that the the higher the length, the more difficult it gets to bend. Okay, so this far, what we have done is um, we have looked at uh, how we can reduce a 3D rod model into a 2D beam model. How can I learn the constitutive law? Now, what I want to do is I want to take another example to go one step forward. So now I want to show that, okay, how can I take a plate model, which is more difficult than or more computationally expensive than a rod model, and then cast that to a rod model? Um, I'll be using the example of a ribbon, and I'm going to describe the problem problem formulation in a minute. So a ribbon again, its length is much much larger than the width and the height. A rod, its length is much much larger than the width, and the width is usually on the same order of magnitude as height. A plate, on the other hand, is length and width. Both of them are much much larger than the height. Okay. Now. Um, a ribbon is a subset of plate. Okay. I can use a plate simulation to simulate a rib ribbon. However, a ribbon is not a subset of rod. So I cannot take a rod simulation and expect that a ribbon simulation will, and a ribbon will be captured by the same simulation. I'll show examples in a minute. Now, for this framework, for this overall project where I want to cast, I want to use a rod model to simulate a ribbon model. I know that I cannot use simple physics-based rod model, but can I use machine learning to augment it? Before that, uh, let's just briefly talk about how we simulate plates. It's kind of like a similar, so I divide a plate into a bunch of triangles, and the angle between the normals of two subsequent, two near, between two nearby triangles will give rise to bending energy. Okay, this is the, given by this equation here. Again, let's not, discuss, let's, let's not get bogged down in equations. And then in between every two nodes, for example, let's say xi and xj, there is some stretching energy. If I want to move one node far from the other, then that will give rise to stretching energy. So in this study, we will be only considering, we'll be only using plate simulation, not shells. And keep again, keep in mind that ribbons are a subset of shells or a subset of plates. And so, of course, a plate simulation will be able to capture a ribbon, like the deformation of a ribbon. Now, let's see some pictures and let's talk about our setup. Uh, let's say I have a ribbon in between two clamps. I first compress the ribbon so that it takes a bent shape like this, and then I apply transverse or shear displacement. So I move one clamp relative to the other clamp. Okay. So we will be, uh, in our study, we will be looking at this deformation and then we will try to see if we can uh, capture it using, uh, using rod-based rod algorithms. So here I'm just using plate simulation I am showing four videos at four different values of width. Okay? The wide ribbon that undergoes this so-called supercritical pitchfork bifurcation the, the soonest. Okay? And as the width decreases, the onset of bifurcation happens later. I'll show plots in a minute. So here in the first column, I have some small deformation and we call it the U shape. And then it will take so-called US shape, which is when bifurcation happens, and then it will take 
so-called S-shape, all right? And in its, when it is going over, when it is going through this bifurcation as well as after the bifurcation, I can have US plus and US, um, US plus and US minus as well as S plus and S minus shape. So there are like two possibilities. To show, like, to understand why do why we study this thing, this is actually a pretty important important mechanics problem. So, if I plot, let's say the height of the midpoint as a function of normalized shear or how much displacement I have applied, right? I see a curve like this. So, initially the height is a lot, and then as I'm moving one clump away from the other, the height starts to decrease. If I plot the reaction force, this is this red line, it reaches a maximum here, which indicates supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. Okay. Now, if I plot, let's say I plot the height as a function of the shear angle, I see plots like this. Okay. This is the same plot like this. All right. So plot like this. I am again plotting the height as a function of shear angle. For a narrow ribbon. So the height over length ratio is 1 over 20. Right? So its width is 1 over 20th the length. But if I keep increasing the width, what do we see? I am plotting my results from rod model, plate model, and experiments. The plate model and the experiments, right, they always agree. So experiments are in circles. Plate model is this green line. The rod model initially it agrees, and then as the ribbon gets wider, it doesn't agree. This kind of makes sense because when a ribbon is really thin, it is kind of like a rod, and when the ribbon is wider, it behaves more and more like a plate. But one developing one-dimensional ribbon model is a problem that goes back to 1930s, and people have been trying to come up with a lot of these equations to instead of using one half e i kappa squared plus one half g j tau squared plus one half e a stretching squared, which is my usual expression for Kirchhoff rod model. They have been trying to come up with these equations that are, uh, you know, that, that are like, they're really interesting and very impressive. However, why don't we just simply use a neural network? Right? Um, given the advances in, in, in neural network that we have, so this is what we will be doing. Instead of using an equation like this, I will be ex expressing the energy model as a neural network. So I'll be summing up the energy at every node, they will depend on the curvatures, the twist, and the stretching, and now have to calculate, evaluate these weights and prime weights and biases theta. Right? So I'll be using same the neural OD framework, and I'll be kind of going through the same process more or less. Um, uh, when it comes to training, it looks like things get a little bit more complicated. So it kind of like you have to train it, you have to choose the right training data, uh, right part of the training data, and you know, and kind of pre-train it, train it, retrain it, and so on. I won't go into the details. This is a preliminary work, by the way, so hopefully we will get better and better. But the training process seems to be like a mess. We use, uh, for our ground truth data, we use plate simulation, which is very time consuming. The reason, of course, it's time consuming is we have like, a lot of nodes, right? Uh, it's a two-dimensional, I have to take, I have to create a mesh in 2D. And then in the ribbon model, instead of taking a mesh on 2D, I'm just using a center line. Okay. Now, for narrow ribbons, all of them will agree, right? My neural network or node-based method, my DER and my ground truth, all of them will agree. And I have my midpoint height as a function of the displacement that I'm applying, so all of them can agree. And then if the ribbon gets wider, uh, the plate and ribbon, mo the node-based model, they can uh, they agree better than DR model. So here I have my plate model, my neural node neural ODE-based model, and uh, experiments there here, and my DR simulation that is farther off. Of course, the node simulation is not there yet. There's still some some there's still some deviations, but we hope to get better and better at it. In summary. Uh, you know, neural networks can be used to represent the elastic energy of a, like a wider ribbon using rod-like kinematics. Again, because we know that the underlying governing PDE is just mx double dot is equal to the sum of forces. So 
This allows us to focus on just the constitutive behavior. And some of these problems have been um, have been baffling scientists for for almost a century now. All right. To the last 10 minutes or so of my talk, um, and I want to talk about inverse design. Right? Uh, so, so, so far, what we have been saying is, okay, I can simulate these things, I can go forward. I take a configuration, I see how it behaves, how it deforms under a bunch of external forces and so on. But the real value of the simulations is when I can use them for, you know, for inverse design, like how the robot should move or how I should uh, design this manufacturing process and so on. So what here I'll be doing is I'll be going over and, and uh, something that's very exciting to us is how to develop a planar fabrication process so that I can get three-dimensional shape of target features. For example, let's say I want to get a hemispherical curve, hemispherical uh, hemispherical cap starting from a planar shape. Or I can imagine that I want to uh, fabricate the face of a human to create masks, or I want to fabricate a wig um, and so on. The reason we care about this is because um, I can use a lot of existing 3D, uh, like 3D printing tools like PCB printers and so on. So I can take my planar shape, print a bunch of stuff on it, and then I can deploy that in 3D. So we have thought about using them for health monitoring and so on. It is a, a fake mouse, not real. And we can also, of course, uh, reduce the volume for transportation. When, when you take a three-dimensional ship and you stretch it everywhere, you will see wrinkles and folds and so on. But in this method, I, I, I take a planar shape, I develop that in a three-dimensional shape, and then if I stretch everywhere, it will actually take a planar shape. So I can stack one on top of another, send it up to space, for example, let's say, and then I can deploy it as needed. Now, the concept, the, we'll be using two fundamental concepts be, uh, behind it. The first concept is the idea of strain mismatch. Okay. So in 1D, this concept goes back to uh, John Harrison, who was a clock maker in, in England. If I have a bimetallic strip, once one metal has higher thermal coefficient than the other and I heat it up, it will take a curved shape that is used in as a circuit breaker and so on. In 2D, let's say I take two layers of plates, top layer and bottom layer. I stretch the bottom layer and I glue the two, two together. I will create a so-called soft composite. The shape of that composite, if I release it, we naively thought that it is going to be hemispherical because it's symmetric, there's radial symmetry in the fabrication. So, you know, if, if I make a composite like this, of course it should take, I, we thought that it will take hemispherical shape, but in reality, what happens is it takes like a crumpled shape. It has wrinkles. We call it the pre buckling shape. Very quickly, we have fabrication. Uh, we have come with a, like a pretty good experimental device for this to make this thing. So we take a piston and we fix bottom layer on top of it. Then I screw up the piston to stretch the bottom layer. This way I can control the amount of pre-stretch in my bottom layer. I put my unstretched top layer on top of it, and then I cut this part, I cut the composite, and it takes a free buckling shape. And of course we have experiments too. Uh, we have done actual experiments. These are some photographs and CAD models from our experiments. Now, um, to understand a little bit more why this happens, we can just use pure physics. So we, depending on how much pre-stretch I put in, I can get zero wrinkles, two wrinkles, three wrinkles, or four wrinkles, and why that happens. So let's say I plot my strain energy as a function of pre-stretch, and I assume that my shape is going to be like hemisphere or hemispherical cap. Then I will have a curve like this. This is qualitative curve, by the way. I will show like a real plots later. But if I assume that it will take k equals to two shape, I will have a curve like this. Okay, so between after a critical value of pre-stretch, it is energetically favorable for the for the uh, composite to take k equals to two. Now the real plot, the real energy landscape will look like this, and I'm not going into the details of this. Uh, the point to show is that uh, two energy curves can be very parallel to one another, and they're not just two, but a lot of different possible mode shapes. All right. So, however, even though we can understand the forward process, our inverse problem is still not solved, right? For that, what we do is we introduce another concept of Kirigami. 
So now what I'm going to do instead of taking the top layer, I'm going to cut the top layer along specific directions. And the Kirigami pattern, depending on the Kirigami pattern, we can get, we, can, we have control over the three dimensional shape, right? And so I have experiments and simulations. So I'm using this lotus shaped pattern that we came up with heuristically and then did some experiments with it. Depending on pre stretch, you can see that initially at 15 or 10, 5% pre stretch, it is like a hemispherical cap. Then it takes k equals to two or taco shape. And then if I get 25 to 30% pre stretch, it again goes back to hemisphere, hemispherical shape. This is really interesting, right? Now, if I'm dealing with hemispherical shape, then I can uh, I can use some theoretical analysis and do use ansatz and so on to to kind of come up with this method. But what if I want some other shape? I want what if I want like a flower or peanut shape? Then how do you go about it? So this is where we'll be using uh, machine learning and specifically variational autoencoder. Kind of the idea is this that we know from computer vision that um, the a a family of images actually lie in a much smaller dimensional manifold, right? So I can take a bunch, a lot of Kirigami patterns, train an encoder network, reduce this, let's say 64 by 64 by, or 128 by 128 pixels to five to 10 latent features. And then of course I can feed it through the decoder network and hopefully we will get that training, uh, we'll get the original Kirigami pattern. Right? So instead of, optimizing for these images, we optimize in the latent space, and we have to add two physical parameters to account for kind of the physics and mechanics. One is the pre-stretch lambda, as well as the size R, the size of the, of the structure. And then we feed it through active learning framework. Um, and it turns out that active learning works better than some other existing, some other frameworks that I don't know exactly why, but uh, something that could be studied later. Whatever framework you use for simulation, for Optimization doesn't matter. Uh, the point is I'm I'm using latent features to, to optimize for. So let's go over the training process pretty quick. So let's say I want to focus on structures that have reflectional symmetry, right? So I'll be taking the first quadrant and I will be dividing the first quadrant into 13 regions. And I will be randomly picking uh, one, two, three, or all 13 regions out of those 13 regions. So this will create a training data set and I'll be using uh, this training data, I believe about 70,000 training images to train my auto uh, variational autoencoder. And we also account for reflectional and various types of symmetries. Uh, so in the training data, whenever there is a training data, we take the symmetric versions of that as well. Now, how many latent features do I need? Okay. It turns out after I run the optimization and so on and do some experiments, so if I plot the structural similarity index measure, I'm going to, I will go over what I mean by this uh, later. As a function of latent features, it looks like after about six latent features, uh, there's not a lot of change in, uh, there's not a lot of change in, in, uh, in quality. The structural similarity index measure, it represents, uh, essentially we are looking at the height at all the nodes uh, and comparing the, comparing and, and comparing two structures using those heights. And that helps us get a similarity measure. One means perfect, zero means the worst. So now I only have six numbers plus a couple more to optimize for. Uh, let's go over some examples. So let's say my target shape is like this. So I get my solution Kirigami pattern using my latent features and then a couple other physical parameters. There are my experiments, simulations and experiments. I'm plotting structural similarity index measure as a function of uh, as a function of the number of iterations. It looks like after about 61 iteration, we get about 91% accuracy, which is kind of good enough, but we could have you know, tried more and more, but uh, that's kind of good enough for us. Also multiple solutions, we can get multiple solutions, um, you know, for the same target shape, which is, which is like, it is known that we should get multiple solutions, that there are multiple solutions, but it is nice to see that we can actually get multiple solutions from the same framework. Then let's talk about our, uh, another example where we wanted to start a flower ship, get a flower ship. I have my solution, 92% accuracy, uh, simulations and experiments, and it takes about uh, 
you know, about actually it takes just about 40 to 50 iterations or so, which is which I think is, is pretty impressive uh, given uh, and Dr. Leishin Ma and Murunmay Mungikar did this work and I, I think they did a pretty good job at cutting down the computation time. And of course, we can do a lot more examples. Now, very quickly in the last three minutes or so, a really cool part of this is we can actually make it bistable, right? So instead of the structure being soft and three-dimensional, I can make it bistable for that it, so that it can be used to grip or grasp, grasp something. The concept is similar. The only difference is instead of one Kirigami layer and one substrate layer, I will have one Kirigami layer, a substrate layer, and then a bottom Kirigami layer, right? And we did some indentation experiments to actually show that it is it is bistable. So I'm plotting force as a function of displacement, and of course it goes through a peak and then goes through a minimum. Now, interestingly, we can actually use our same solution that I introduced to do its inverse design. Okay, so if I want to get let's say hemispherical cap shape or a peanut shape, I can do it using my bilayer setup, which is what I discussed monostable bilayer setup, which I discussed like a couple of minutes ago. If I apply the same solution to the trilayer case, it doesn't work, right? So it does not work. However, if I just tune two parameters, I can actually use the same Kirigami pattern to get the trilayer shape. This I believe can be explained some through some simple energy balance and so on, uh, which we don't do in our studies, but um, it is good to know that we can actually use you know, like a variational autoencoder to reduce the order of the model and then come up with bistable structures of target shapes and use them for things like uh, soft robotic gripper. So we can we actuate them uh, in this case using uh, shape memory alloy and here to there's no actuation in here just under its own weight it will it will get actuated. So with that, I would like to summarize by saying that okay, we use discrete differential geometry based simulations using pure physics for simulation of robots and contact. And then we combine that with machine learning to reduce the order of the model. And then we use the variational autoencoder for model reduction to come up with uh, some inverse design methods. I'd like to thank my funding agencies, National Science Foundation and USD and Department of Energy, as well as Amazon for supporting this work. And if there is any time, I'd like to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Khalid. Uh, that was very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, let's have a Q&A session. Um, is there any question from audience? You can unmute yourself and ask. I can start with one. If you go to Kaligami, you know, the, the autoencoder, uh, the training, I, I see that you just look at the first quadrant and you know, mm -hmm. divide into 13. Yes. And, um, how, and you are, are you saying you're training autoencoder like 13 different autoencoder here or uh no I um i didn't yeah follow it means like yeah so we have to basically we have to take arbitrary kirigami patterns to train the autoencoder right yeah so this is a way of systemizing the arbitrary data generation part so in, so we train one autoencoder but we train we generate training data by taking, let's say my inverse training data, I, I will have just region one, two, and three, and everything else will be off, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So then I will have a training, I will have an image that will have just, one, two, just uh, yeah, one, two, and three. And then I will have, let's say one, two, and three. And then let's say I want to take one, five, and nine, right? right. So by training it this way, uh, even though we, so by training it this way, we can wow. generate training data that allows the autoencoder to generalize. So for example, when I get my solutions, right? Uh, right like for example, here, they're not, I cannot generate my, this solution using uh, my training data generation method. Um, so in, in summary, it will, it's just a way of systemizing the training data generation. I see, I see. So that's your parameter space, like some sort of combinatorial. Yeah, um, yes, yeah. Parameter yeah. space, yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Got it. Is there any question from audience? Uh, one more question from you. Well, then, um, those 
you, you got that from experimental data, right? I mean, those um, to train the autoencoder, I guess you could do that experimentally very easily and get uh, the no, data we... and the, put that in the autoencoder training. Uh, no, we you, used, yeah, we used, we used, uh, we didn't, I wouldn't even call it simulation. It's just like MATLAB script to generate random images. And we train the autoencoder using randomly generated synthetic synthetic images. And then it is, um, then we run the whole optimization, then we do the training thing, and then we run the whole optimization scheme to find out what are the best latent parameters. Then we can, using those latent parameters, you can recreate this image and then implement that in experiments. And then what we see is the experiments and simulations will agree. I see. Uh, can you share a, you know, I, I think you did mention that, but um, can you elaborate uh, what this kind of, you know, the design, you know, uh, can be applied to, you know, to, the potential applications of, of mm -hmm. this? Yeah. So uh, there are a couple, I mean, there are these monostable things, right? I can get like three dimensional shapes. So now let's say um, I want to have, so patient specific, uh, health care monitoring patch, for example, right? Uh, everybody's head, everybody's kneecap, everybody's you know, like arms, they're different. So I can, let's say, 3D scan part of a human body and come up with a shape that will conform to that part of the body. Mm. But because the fabrication process happens in three, in just planar, it's a two-dimensional, during the fabrication process on top of the substrate layer for example, I can print circuits to, to to detect, let's say, when a patient falls, or I can you know, I can write circuits to monitor glucose or whatever. That's one. But I think if, for us, given that we have a you know, we try to we have some work in robotics, uh, the bistability is pretty neat. So I can um, so bistability means that I can go from one shape to the other, and yeah. I don't need to keep applying power to it. I only need to apply power to transition from one shape to the other. Right. So that can be used for uh, multimodal locomotion. And we do have a paper with uh, Carmel Majidian Leaning Yao's group that uses bistability to for reconfigurable amphibious uh, robots. Mm. Right? So if, it, if it can reconfigure itself, then it can be like a quadruped that is walking on the, that is walking on sand for some time and then it can start swimming, but now its legs could be converted to be to be some type of propelling mechanism. Mm, I see. Yeah, I mean, it's, probably there are more applications of this, um, which we cannot think of for now, uh, but yeah, that's very interesting and, um, you know, exciting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there any other question from audience um if not let's let's thank uh, our tip speaker uh today uh for the wonderful talk um from khalid um uh, thank you so much khalid thank you, uh, thank you so much thank you for hosting me